who's ready for the word this morning. Amen? Amen. Yeah, just to let you know that, yes, over the next couple of weeks, my wife and I and daughter, uh, we're going to be gone. Please pray for us while we're traveling. And uh, we're going to be going to uh, Italy and stuff on vacation this year. We're excited about that opportunity that God's blessed us with. And we have a little side thing that we, we, we have dogs that we uh, help provide puppies for people. And that's helping us make this trip. But we're really excited because next Sunday we're going to be just vacationing. But the following Sunday, I'm going to be ministering in an international church. Um, in Padova, uh, Italy. It's a church that's filled with people from Nigeria and India, the Philippines, some Italians. It's an English-speaking church, although they do translate into Italian for the Italians who come in. And uh, their pastor just last week um, let them know that he was going to be leaving them. And, uh, and so that was a little bit of a surprise for them. So keep them in prayer. And God put a word in my heart for this church. And I believe that the word he put in my heart is, is, is for them and for this time. Um, also, you know, it, just to give you a little bit of back history so maybe you can pray for them because I'd like our church to kind of partner with this, with this other church in Italy in prayer. About a year and a half ago at Christmas time, their pastors who founded their church were burned in a fire. Their apartment caught on fire and both the, the pastor and his wife died. And they've been through kind of interim pastors for the past um, couple of years. And so I know that this church is struggling. Their pastor who um, has been with them right now, has been traveling from Rome to Venice, which is about a three-hour train trip every week, um, going up on Saturday, coming back on Sunday so he could work at his job during the week. And uh, and it's been a long process for him. But keep them in prayer, will you? And just pray that God anoints us and for the ministry that he's doing there. I'm so just, I'm always excited when I can minister in another culture and uh, excited to do that. And so, so keep them in prayer. And then we will be back. Um, Matt Bradshaw is going to be filling in the pulpit for me. So our associate pastor, Matt, and I think for some of you, he's no stranger. He's spoken here before as well. He'll bring a great word. So I want to encourage you, while the pastor's away, the congregation shouldn't go out and play. So come to church, all right? And so, so I want to encourage you to come out to church. Danelle's going to be back next week leading worship. And, uh, and I appreciate Kimberly filling in for these last three weeks for her. Her. She's done a wonderful job, and um, and just you keep having church, and we'll be we'll be back after two weeks and, and ready to uh, share with you good things that God has done. Amen. Every pastor needs a break every now and then. Amen. And uh, after this past year of uh, doing a building project, and our church has grown so much, and we brought two different staff families in. I'm ready for a break. I'm ready to kind of go chill for a little bit. So, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and I'm gonna eat gelato and cannolis and pasta and walk a lot of miles to work it off. And, uh, and then we'll be back um, back with our church family. We love Colorado. We love our church family. No, I'm not preaching at that church to like go interview or something. I don't want anyone to think that we're just going to go minister there. Amen. And uh, this is our this is our church family and our church home. Amen. But uh, I, I love cross cultural ministry experiences. Though they're a great thing. I want to talk to you this morning about daring to dream. Dare to dream. How many of you have ever experienced God speaking directly to your heart about something he wants to do in your life or through you? You ever experienced that? You know, Michael Pence is, is not crazy. God speaks to his sheep. He speaks to his people. He speaks into our lives. And, uh, and that's a very real thing. Regardless of your politics, anyone who wants to say that, that God doesn't speak to people today has, has no idea who God is. Because he speaks into our lives, whether that is through a dream or whether it's a vision while in prayer or whether it's an impression upon the heart that God's directing or guiding your life. I want to challenge you as Christians to dare to dream, to allow God to speak into your life what he wants to do through you and in you, in your family, in your community, in your church, at your work, because God wants to use you. You all have a purpose. Do you believe that? We are all created with the purpose that God wants to accomplish well, this morning I want to go and I want to talk about a character in the Bible. We talked about him about five weeks ago, but in a different context. But if you bear with me and allow me to visit his person, his character again in the Bible, I'd like to talk about Joseph. Because Joseph, when he was a young teen, when he was probably around 14, 15 years old, the age of some of our teenagers here in this room, he was given a dream, not one, but two different dreams by God that were basically indicating the same thing. And his dream was so out of the norm of what should have gone on in his life. Because you have to understand, and I want you to understand this cultural background, Joseph was the second youngest child of Jacob. He was the second youngest out of 12. That means the the chance for the dream that we're going to talk about in a minute to have come true 
the dream puts him in a leadership position over his family, was about, you know, one in a million to happen. He'd have to have his older 10 brothers die because culturally, by his culture, his father, even if he loved him the most, would never have been able to pass his blessings on to Joseph. It would have to go in the order of birthright. But yet God gave him a dream that seemed so far and so distant and so out of order, but it was something he wanted to do in his life, and he was giving him a foreshadowing of what was to come. Let's look at Genesis 37, 1 to 10. It says, so Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. She just loved the little tattletale brother. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. We know it as the coat of colors. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have had another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and 11 stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? I'm going to stop there because otherwise there's five chapters of the Bible I'd have to read. Here is the young kid in the family. He's got one brother a little bit younger than him. His other brothers are all, you know, probably in their mid-20s to 30s. They've got their families. They're having their kids already. And here comes their little punk brother, the one who (coughs) goes out and sees what they're not doing, sees them taking advantage of their father, his father's fortune, and runs back and tells daddy. They despise this kid. And there's rightfully so. You see, Joseph is the firstborn of Rachel, which is the man that, that, that Jacob wanted to marry, but his father-in-law tricked him into marrying his, her older sister first. And so him being the firstborn to his father in his mind, he loved him the most. And he spoiled him. And he gave him this coat of colors. And at this point in his life, at 17 years of age, anybody know any cocky 17-year-olds? <laughs> We're not going there, right, teenagers? Right? Okay. He was a know-it-all. He was pretty arrogant. He knew he had his daddy's love. He knew, you know, you know, daddy, God loves us all, but I'm his favorite type of thing. You know, he knew that his father loved him the most. And then he comes and he shares these dreams with his brother. You're all going to bow down to me one day, basically, is what he's saying. I had a dream, and you all bowed to me. You know, the thing is, the dream that Joseph had was directly from God. It wasn't his own ego. It wasn't his own doing. It wasn't his own lifting up. But God was speaking into his life. And you know what? He needed God to speak into his life because his brothers were getting ready to do something pretty horrible to him. But God was giving him a glimpse of what the future would hold in his life, a dream to hold on to, a dream to look out to a dream of something that was in the plan of the Almighty, though in the natural was the most impossible thing from ever happening. And if it could get any more impossible, it was about to. His brothers in anger one day when he went out to check on them decided, let's kill our brother. So they run out when he comes out and they grab him and they were going to go kill him. And his oldest brother of all said, if he dies, my dad's going to have my head. He was already in hot water with his father because of some other things. And he says, don't kill him. Let's just throw him in this pit for now. We'll come back. We'll figure out what to do with him later. So they threw him in a pit, and he's down in this this deep hole, this well, by himself. It's dark. He's all alone. 
And his older brother goes off to take care of something, figuring when they all calm down and leave, he's going to go rescue his brother and bring him back to his dad and get some brownie points with his father. That's exactly what he was trying to do. But while he was gone, his older brothers decided, okay, if we're not going to kill him, let's sell him off into slavery. They saw this caravan of people coming with slave traders, and they sell him off to be a slave. Now, you have a dream about your brothers bowing down to you and then have them sell you off into slavery. Wouldn't you think that your dream just became a nightmare and it was never going to happen? And so off he goes into slavery, and as I, I told the story a few weeks back, so I'm not going to go real deep into it. But he goes, and when he comes into the, this new land, he comes into the land of Egypt, he's sold into the house of Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, a man who's high up in position, high off with wealth. And God blesses Joseph in that place. And, and Potiphar sees something in this kid. He sees character in him, and he sees some potential in him. And he puts Joseph in charge of his entire house to manage all of the other servants, to manage all of his business, all of his accountings, all of his, 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 uh, his crops and his growth and everything that goes on. He puts Joseph in charge, and God blesses Joseph. And as long as Potiphar is Joseph doing it, Potiphar gets richer and richer, and his house grows larger and larger, and he's doing well. And you think, well, wow, God really kind of turned around and blessed Joseph there. Except for the fact was, Joseph was a pretty good-looking young kid, and Potiphar's wife thought he was pretty cute too. She kind of got the hots for him. She kind of starts saying, hey, Joseph. Joseph would ignore her. This went on for a little while. Joseph, come here, Joseph. Mm -mm. You know, I, I got to tell you. Joseph could have become an arrogant kid at this point thinking, I'm above it all. Who cares? Who cares about the dream God gave to me? I I've been sold off into slavery, and, and I have Potiphar. Now Potiphar's wife wants me too. But no, his character kicked in, and he kept on saying, no, one day she got a hold of him, and she grabbed his, the cloth that covered him, and Joseph actually ended up running out of the room naked and stuff. And then she went to her husband and said, your slave came and tried to attack me, and here's this. And now Joseph finds himself, once again, though he was a slave, he was blessed in Potiphar's house, but now he finds himself going one step lower. He finds himself in jail. He's sent to the dungeon. And in the dungeon, he is now, you know, I got to think that in Joseph's mind, he's probably going, what the heck was I eating that night when I had those dreams? Did I have too much pizza? Did I have too much pasta? Did I have too much spicy food or something? Because I... The, I, this is so far from what God showed me. This is never going to, that will never occur in my life. God can never do this. And, you know, I say that because sometimes when God speaks a vision into our hearts, sometimes when God gives us a dream and we dare to believe in that dream, we dare to believe in the word that God has spoken to us, we dare to think that God is really wanting to do something in our lives, situations get worse afterwards, not better. And we think, well, I must have been just, dream that was all my own idea. That could not have been God. And here he goes into the pit, and he's in the prison, he's in the dungeon. And the head guard signs something different about Joseph. He's got integrity. He hasn't gone debased like the rest of the prisoners, but he's acting with integrity even in that horrible place. And he sees him, and he puts him over some stuff. And he finds out whatever he puts Joseph over seems to be successful. So he puts him over more until Joseph is kind of running the prison. He's over all the other inmates, and he's got authority, and he's got some power because God's blessing him in this place. You know, so Joseph is like, okay. It's like, but it's still not freedom. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Having worked in a prison, it doesn't matter how much authority or trust you get. You're still in prison. It doesn't change. I taught in prison, and I felt like I was in prison. I mean, I got to go out every night. When I taught in a prison, this was over a decade ago. But I used to teach in a prison. One time the doors, the, the power went out, and we got shut in between the security doors, between the yard and freedom. And it was kind of like you're sitting there for an hour going, I don't like how this feels. It doesn't matter if you've been given authority. You're still in prison. He still was not man over his own life. He still didn't have freedom. There was still no wife in his future. There was nothing going for him. And one day he finds two new guys come into the prison. They happen to be the baker and the butler for the king. They're the king's chef or pastry maker and the king's wine taster and the one who serves him his wine. And they come in and they're thrown into jail because there's an attempted assassination against the pharaoh. And one night they each have a dream. 
And in those dreams, they wake up the next morning. Their dreams are troubling them. They don't understand their dreams. And Joseph comes to them and says, God is the interpreter of all dreams. God can tell me what your dream means. Notice he never takes credit for himself. But he said, God can, can give me these. So tell me your dreams. And they tell him his dreams. And as he does, Joseph begins to interpret him. And he basically tells him, he says, Chef, in three days, you're going to be found guilty, and they're going to they're going to they're going to they're going to hang you. They're going to kill you, and the birds are going to pluck your eyes out. And wine taster, you're going to be found innocent, and you're going to be restored to your post. He says, "Now look, when you go back to your post, remember me to Pharaoh. I don't belong in this place. I did, I've done nothing wrong. Get me out of here." And of course, like every guy in prison, yeah, man, I'll take care of you. No problem. Well. Just as the interpretation goes, so what happens, and the baker is killed, and the butler is restored to his post, only the butler forgets Joseph. So now Joseph slinks even further going, I had a chance to get out, and now I'm really stuck here. You know, want to talk about a dream dying? Has God ever given you a vision for something you're supposed to do, and you just feel like it's never going to happen? It's never going to take place. Just let it die. I remember, and you've all heard the story that I've told before of, of that night that I came home and God had spoken. I came from, home from the church and God spoke to my wife. You're going to have a little girl and her name's supposed to be Victoria. Kimberly's like, you're going to think I'm nuts, but I really heard, like, heard God clearly today that we are going to have a little girl. We're supposed to name her Victoria. We're in our early 20s. I'm thinking, sure, great. You know, and then we went through our lives with five years of infertility and doctors said it was impossible. Doctors said I could never have the first kid that I had and stuff. It, was, it seemed to all be my fault and stuff. And yet, y'all know Victoria, you know, she's got a driver's permit and stuff and stuff. And now, now I'm wondering if I'm going to lose my life. But, you know, it, it's, it's like, you know, it's like there was, it got a lot worse for us. God gave a, God gave a word. He gave a dream. It got a lot worse before it ever got better. And I had doctors, I had, I had counselors tell me, give up. Mourn the loss of that child, give up on it, get over, go adopt someone. I'm like, how do you give up when God makes you a promise? But now the doctor said it's impossible. They told me, yeah, if you, 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 go, you go lose a bunch of weight and you, you, you have surgery and, and you take all this medicine and you might have a 20% chance to do all those things. Like it's impossible. Ah, oh, but with God, nothing's impossible. And when God gives us a dream, he gives us a dream. When God gives us a vision, he gives us a vision. He never lacks on that. What we know is the story of Joseph goes on. Some time goes by, and Pharaoh has a dream. He actually has a couple of dreams. And he can't remember them. I want you to know that part about that. He doesn't remember the dreams. And he calls for his magicians and his wise men and his astrologers and his counselors. And he says, tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what it means. I say, what? Tell me what you dreamed? Really, you want me to pretend to get into your head and tell you what you dreamed? Interpreting his dream might be one thing, but telling someone what they dreamed and then interpreting it is a whole different thing. No one can do it. No one can help. So all of a sudden, the wine taster, he remembers, the butler remembers, hey, that dude in prison told me what my dream meant, and it came to pass. So he comes before the king, and he tells Pharaoh, he's like, hey, there was this dude in prison. I was supposed to tell you about him. I forgot, but, you know, he told us what our dreams. It was like when at that time, remember when he threw me in jail that one time, and he threw the baker in two, and we both had these dreams, and this is what happened, and this is what he told us what happened, and it exactly happened. Well, Pharaoh's like, okay, no one else can tell me my dream. Go get the kid. He was probably a young man by this point, in his mid-20s at this point. They send for Joseph. They clean him up. They shave him up. They send him before the king. The first thing Joseph says is, he says, he says, look, God is the interpreter of all dreams, and God can tell you what your dream is and what your dream means. And then he proceeds to tell the Pharaoh what his dreams were. They were dreams about, about stalks of wheat, stalks of wheat that were fat, that were followed by stalks of wheat that were thin, that swallowed them up. And then he tells them about the, the, the cows that came out of the Nile that were fat, and then the cows that were lean coming up out of the Nile and swallowing them up. And he interprets them about how there's going to be seven years of prosperity. Then there's going to be seven years of famine that's going to eat up the seven years of prosperity. But if you would take place and prepare for that, you will be the feeding house for all of the known world. And in that moment, Pharaoh said, who better to 
organized this thing than the one that has given me what my dream and the interpretation is. And we see Joseph now taken from some obscure group of people out in, out in you know, the Palestine to, to the world's greatest empire in Egypt. And he's gone from the, from the, as a slave to the dungeon, from the dungeon to being forgotten about all of a sudden now raised to this place. Who would have ever thought that this 17-year-old kid from this obscure tribe now was going to be sitting? And he's appointed to being the highest man in the land ex- next to Pharaoh. He gives him his own ring. He gives him a palace. He gives him his daughter to marry. I hope she was cute. Wouldn't it be fun if she wasn't, right? I mean, and he restores all of a sudden everything he's lost he has. And there's no one more powerful in the world of the day except for Pharaoh. And right underneath him is Joseph. And just as it is said, seven years of prosperity come. And Joseph organizes all the grain, all the produce, all the things of Egypt, and he puts them, he has barns built, he has storage places built, and he organizes them, and he rations how things go out, so that way it's all organized, so there'll be enough food, not just, in, not just for them and their own people, but to gain the wealth of the world. Because you see, people will give up all of their wealth if they want to eat. And as the years of famine come in, he starts organizing the distribution program. And one day, who shows up at his doorstep? But his brothers. They think he's long gone. They think by now he's probably dead. They have no idea. He doesn't look like their brother. Years have gone by. He's grown up. He speaks in Egyptian. He refuses to speak in his own, and his native tongue. When they come in, he does not want them to know who he is. And what do they all do? But they bow down before him. Just like the dream had said. Notice the second dream, the father and the mother join him, but the first dream, it's just the brothers. And then we know that he doesn't reveal himself to them. He sends them back. He wants to see his brother. He wants to know that his father's alive. So he, he plays this, this cat and mouse game with them. I don't think he was doing it to try and be mean. I think he was doing it to find out if his father was alive and he was afraid that maybe his younger brother had suffered the same fate because they were from the same mom. And eventually we know that he reveals himself to his brothers and his father is brought from their land which is now struck with famine and they all come into Egypt. This is how the Israelites Israelites came into Egypt before they had to be set free. This is at the beginning of that 400 year period. It was a good thing. They were blessed. They were the family of the second highest in the land. And they're given this their own piece of land that's good for pasturing because they're far, they're they tend herds. They have sheep and cattle and things. And they're given this, this, this quality piece of land for, their, for all of their flocks to go and graze out. And they're given food and they're taken care of. And they're treated like royalty because they are the family of Pharaoh's sec- first-hand man, right-hand man. And by now they've all bowed to him. You see the dream. The dream that was so far off. The dream that seemed like it was never going to come to pass. The dream that seemed impossible happened. But there's some things that we learn from this process that I want to mention this morning. The first is in the dream. God gives us all ideas of what he wants to do in our life. God speaks. If we're asking God, if we're surrendering our hearts to God, God's got a purpose and a plan for each of us, and he wants to do something through us. God may be giving you a promise for your children, or a promise for your family, or a promise for your marriage, a promise for ministry, or a promise for a role in the church. Whatever that might be, God has given you promises. He's spoken into your heart. He's given you dreams. But the first thing that we have to do in that process is we have to learn that we need to surrender to the maker of the plan. Notice I didn't say surrender to the dream. You see, a lot of people, when God begins to speak into their lives, they get their eyes focused on what he's speaking to them about, and they put their eyes on the plan. And they take them off of Jesus. What happens when that takes place? All of a sudden, when our eyes are on the plan, who wouldn't like the plan when my brothers and, when my brothers and father and everyone's bowing down to me? Who wouldn't want that? But if we get stuck in that, arrogance comes into our heart. And sometimes when God shows you the blessings, 
he's going to do in your life, the things he's going to do in your life. Sometimes we look at that and we get so focused on that. And if anything in our life tries to veer us off of how we think we should get to the end goal of that plan, we take control. But God's saying, no, I want you to surrender to the maker of the plan. I want you to surrender to God. Because if God has given you a word, he doesn't want you to focus on that word near as much as he wants you to focus on him. And remember that God's hope is not false hope. God's hope is not false hope. Just like I told you about Victoria, when God spoke that word to my wife, I mean, it was years, it was almost a decade before we'd even start trying for another child. And almost 14 years before she was, before she was born. God's hope wasn't false hope, it was real hope. I'll tell you in that, I had to learn how to surrender to the maker, not to surrender to his plan. I had to get my eyes off of what I wanted him to do and just on who he was. And God wants you to realize because sometimes in your current position when God gives the dream, sometimes you're not in the place to receive that. We want to go out the next day and we want it to happen. We, you know, it's like, oh, okay, let's make this dream happen. Sometimes that, that fulfillment is going to be years down the road. And then when we have obstacles to that dream, when things come against it and there's opposition, it can be so quick to give up. We can be so quick to surrender ourselves even to back to sin or to other things, thinking God forgot about me. He doesn't care. He gave me a dream and then he didn't fulfill the dream. What was God doing? I'm just going to do my own thing. Because we're so focused on the plan. But we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. I like that from the New Living Translation. Let me say that again. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who, is a champion a loser? The champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor, Beside God's throne. Okay, I want to let you know that Jesus was God. Jesus is God. He was fully God. And when he came down to earth, before he came to earth, he knew full well that he was going to be glorified and seated at the right hand of God the Father. He knew the Father's plan. He knew what was going to happen. It didn't change the fact that he had to leave heaven, be born in a a barn as one of the poorest of his creations, be ridiculed on this earth, be made fun of because he was different from everybody else. He, no one believed in him. There were very few in comparison to the population who actually believed in him. And then he'd have to be ridiculed, mocked, and crucified before he'd ever be raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God. Yet what did Jesus do while he was on this earth? He kept his relationship with God alive. He was in constant prayer with the Father. He was in constant communion. He kept his eyes focused, not on the the plan, but on the Father, even to the point of saying, Father, if, if, if it's your will and you can let this plan go another way, please do it. But he kept his eyes fixed on the Father, not on everything else going on. And he didn't exactly experience an easy time on earth. You know what I'm saying? But where's he now? He's seated at the right hand of God, isn't he? Where did Joseph end up? On the throne with his brothers bowing before him. I am confident that the man that stood before them that they bowed to was a very different man than the one that was thrown in the pit and sold into slavery. He had years of God preparing him. He had years of God shifting him in places so he could be in just the right place at the right time when the Pharaoh would call for him. If he was never sold into slavery, he would have never been in Egypt. If Pharaoh's wife never lusted for him, he would have never been in prison. And if the butler had never heard his dream interpreted, his name would have never been brought before Pharaoh. Every one of those places, while he was going through them, looked like, looked like a disappointment, looked like one step further away from the dream, looked like one more, one more problem. But I believe that Joseph kept his life focused 
on God. We see this because we see his character, his integrity, and the blessings of God in his life. Because God was working all of those things out to put him in the place and to prepare him for that time when he would rule a nation. When his life went lower, he focused higher. When his life seemed to go low, he focused high. He focused on God. Just like when our life can go low, we need to put our focus on Jesus, who is what? He is the champion of our faith. He didn't say, oh, just give up and go do what makes me happy. God forgot about me, so I'm going to go get drunk tonight. God didn't give me what I want, so I'm going to go out and find a woman to sleep with. God didn't give me what I want, so I'm going to go out and just pursue money. No, he surrendered to the master, and he stayed the course. And that's the second thing I want to talk about, staying the course. We have to remain surrendered to God and stay the course. His His circumstances were by no means of his own doing. And sometimes in our life, our circumstances are by no means of our doing. But it's another thing when we start to track ourselves differently. He didn't sit there and go, hold on, I'm supposed to be the leader. I need to push to make this happen. I need to manipulate to make that happen. You know, how often do people trying to attain their goals try to manipulate their circumstances or situations, people around them to get what they want to get to go where they want to go? He didn't do that. He just stayed the course. Whatever was set before him, he just did it with all of his might. And he stayed the course. You know, sometimes when God gives us a dream or a vision about what's going to happen, he doesn't want us to be so focused on making it happen. He just wants us to do with excellence what he's placed us in the circumstance to do. Are you hearing what I'm saying when I say that? I had a person once in a church, they wanted, they, they wanted position in the church, they wanted ministry in the church, and they were given a place to minister, and all they did was complain about that place to minister because it wasn't what they thought they should be doing. It's like, really? They would come and tell me what the vision God gave them was. they tell me over and over and over about this vision that God gave them, what they're supposed to be doing. I'm saying, and that what you're doing really fulfills some of what God spoke to your heart. Oh, but it was working with kids, so it wasn't important to them. I'm like, really? Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, whatever you do, do well. For when you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom. If I read it from the New King James Version, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. You see, you have to realize, though God might give us lofty dreams or vision of what's going to come in our life, what he's really looking for is for us to put our hand to whatever is in front of us at the moment and be faithful in that thing. And if you can learn to be faithful where you're at, if you can learn to be faithful where God has placed you, if you can let your hand do mightily at whatever is there in front of you, instead of saying, but I'm supposed to be doing that, and I'm supposed to be doing this, and say, hold it, but this is where God's placed me. It's not like Joseph went out looking for slavery and to go to Potiphar's house. He didn't look to get put into prison. But because whatever his hand found to do, he did it with all of his might, God blessed him time and time and time again. He didn't know what was ahead. In fact, if you were to look at the dream that God had given him, it looked like it was dead. 2 Corinthians 2.9 says, this is what the scripture mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You know, when God has a plan, God will accomplish his plan. But what he wants us to do is stay the course. Be faithful in the little things. Luke 16, 10, Jesus says, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. We have to learn to be faithful in the little things and then know that when that time comes and the time is right, God will bring us to that place where we can then be faithful in the larger things. But sometimes we want to go from here to here and God's like, no, we're going to go on a few steps. And sometimes it seems like we're going on steps here, but what we don't realize is when those steps seem like they're going down, there's an elevator that shoots you all the way to the top at the end. We need to hold fast in our faith and being faithful in those small things. James James 2.18 says, Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. 
when we are faithful in those little things, when we are faithful in those little deeds, God brings us to the place that he wants to place us. Why? Because it's in his time, in his plan, not in our own. So whatever's placed before us, do it with all we have. Stay the course and be faithful in those things. The last thing, I'm almost done. The last thing is in the moment that he needed to, Joseph seized the victory. Seized the victory. I want you to think about this for a minute, okay? God gives me a dream. I tell my brothers the dream. I tell my father the dream. They get ticked off at me. They throw me in a pit, and they sell me into slavery. Okay, life kind of stinks now. So I'm going to slavery, and whew, I get in the richest dude in the land's house, and, and God blesses me, and so I do well, and I get elevated. Awesome. This isn't as bad as I thought. It's a little bit easier than I thought it was going to be. Dang it, I had to be so good looking that, that, the, that the boss's wife's coming after me. Now I'm in jail. Okay, God blesses me again, but I'm still stuck in jail. Then I help some dudes out, and they forget all about me. Could it get any worse? What do you mean you want me to tell Pharaoh what his dream was? If I don't tell Pharaoh what his dream was and I'm wrong, what happens? I can't go any lower than jail, so what's the other alternative? I mean, think about it for a minute. Every step he took, God was watching him. I just had to throw that in, sorry. Every step he took, though, seemed down. There was only one place to go lower. So when the door and the opportunity came knocking, it was kind of like, okay, I'll interpret the dream for God, but if Pharaoh doesn't like it, he's going to have my head. Did that keep him from going forth and doing it? And on top of it, if he has to interpret the dream, what if Pharaoh doesn't like the interpretation? Kings have been known throughout the centuries when anyone brought them wisdom or a word and they didn't like it to kill the messenger. You know, I ever heard, you know, I'm just the messenger, don't, don't shoot me? Yeah. Oh, no, land's going to go into... You're going to have seven years of bad and eat up all the seven years of good. Yeah, everybody wants to hear that one. But what did he do? He first of all said, only God can tell you what your dream is and give the interpretation. Only God can. And he stood in faith in God and he seized the opportunity. Because you see, there's a time, there's a time in our lives when God is saying, okay, I want you to jump now. It, he had to take that moment by faith. He had to believe no matter what the outcome, that God was going to be in it. Our dreams that God gives us, the vision God gives us, whether that's for our family or for our church or for ministry or whatever it might be in our lives, when God gives them to us, they can happen, but we've got to be ready to seize the opportunity when it comes to us. We have to take the victory and not be afraid because it might look like it could be worse than better. And that's when we have to say, God, I'm trusting you. God, I'm trusting you in this time. I'm God, I'm trusting you in this moment. I'm trusting you to accomplish your plan because it's not about me. It's about you. I've already surrendered to you, not to your plan. I've already stayed the course. And if this is the moment I'm supposed to jump, I'm going to believe that you're going to make the way because it really looks impossible to me still. I don't think he believed even at interpreting the dream of the Pharaoh. I don't think there was any expectation that Pharaoh was going to give him the job and raise him to the elevated position that he was raised to. He probably thought, I'm going to tell him what it means, and he's going to throw me back in jail. Nowhere was there any indication, if you do this, I'm going to make you rich, powerful, marry my daughter, the cute one. They had two kids, so. So I ask you today, you might be at a different place. If God has spoken into your life, are you surrendered to the plan or are you surrendered to God? Because God doesn't want you to be focused on the plan. He wants you to be focused on him. And when we're focused on him, he'll accomplish what he wants to accomplish. 
Are you staying the course? Are you staying the course in your faithfulness to the Lord, keeping your integrity, keeping your walk with God right? Are you staying the course even though it seems so far off, so impossible? Are you just being faithful in what God has placed in your hands now to be faithful to him? And are you prepared to seize the moment when God says now? Because that's what faith is. That when God says now, we say, okay, here I am, Lord, use me. Because I believe that there are people here today and you've wondered. You've let go of things. You've just kind of walked away. You've said it's never going to happen. Don't think that. Don't think that. God's got a plan. Keep your eyes focused on him. Keep your heart set on him. Stay the course. Be faithful in what he's called you to do and where, where he's placed you. And be ready when that moment comes to seize the victory. Would you bow your heads with me?